encounters improve the quality of our lives. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life without God. Encounters we activate purpose and calling in our life. Encounters come to restore intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you. Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the Word. Tonight is a special night. It's an anointing service. And so I am persuaded our lives will never be the same again. I've studied the anointing for a while. The propensities, the possibilities, the dimensions that are enshrined within the anointing are realities that we cannot fathom. No matter how much of it we have seen, I tell you the truth, we will never exhaust it even after the years of many generations. And so tonight, we are just going to trust God to minister to us by the anointing and to empower us by the anointing to go into the world and represent and witness to Christ and to his kingdom in a way that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has occurred to the heart of man. Glory to God. I'm just taking time so that it's the media people can get their acts together. I don't know this sound we are producing here tonight. If you need to pray, spend time to pray. This is not the night to come and play around. Glory to God. <laughs> Satan. <laughs> we are not in a new location. This is where we have always been. So I rebuke confusion from your minds. <laughs> I think we need to add this technical unit to the prayer department. They, they need to understand the sensitive position they occupy. It's not just about wearing black and black and running around during service. <laughs> you need to know the sounds you need to pipe from heaven. Hallelujah. Help me. Let's sing a song to help them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Matthew 24, verse 35. Let's begin from there. Glory to God. Matthew 24, verse 35. You know, when you walk with God for a while, you will learn something. Your feelings and even the circumstances around you, although beautiful, miraculous, like we've been hearing several testimonies, they are not sure grounds to build your faith. Some of you may have seen the hand of God in a very mighty way, like we continue to see in this place. But no matter how much of the manifestation of the power of God that you see, it's not a potent, reliable ground enough to build your faith. In all of your research of God and his realm, you will find out only one reality has the capacity, the stature, and the reliability upon which your life can be built and that's the word of God and so this scripture Jesus was speaking about the veracity the efficacy and the reliability of his word and he said even heaven and earth shall pass away he said but my word shall never pass away heaven you know, most of us are expecting that at the end of time, we are going to be part of the bridegroom of the Lamb and enjoy with him for a thousand years in heaven. Most of us are hoping and praying to make heaven at the end of time. But Jesus was revealing to us something more reliable than even heaven itself. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away. He said, but not one jot of my word shall pass away he's telling you that there is a superior guarantee in your lifetime why you are yet here something more reliable than even the heaven that many look forward to isaiah 34 verse 16 it says search ye out of the book of the law and read he said not one of these shall fail he said the mouth of the lord it has spoken it and he said his spirit has gathered it. Not one of these shall fail. The mouth of the Lord, it has spoken it. And his spirit has gathered it. I'm saying this to let you know. The reason we will continue. The reason we will keep doing impact. The reason we will stay focused. Is not necessarily because of the testimonies we have. And by implication... It's also not because of the challenges that we go through. It's because of the reliability of the word of God. In recent times, my faith has been challenged. My convictions have been attacked. You know, some of us came into the, the kingdom of God during the faith movement. You know, there have been several movements as touching the advancement of God's kingdom. At least in our context here in Africa, there was the holy, holiness movement, then the faith movement, then the prosperity movement, then the prophetic movement, then the apostolic movement that we are in now. So there have been many moves. Some of us came into the kingdom during the faith move that bettered also the prosperity movement. And so we are a people that define our reality based on the word of God. We talk the word. We sing the word. We act the word. There is nothing we do that there is no scripture or revelation behind it. Even when it appears to be extreme, we stay there. Because we were taught to live and function only by the word. And so in recent times, I've had to go back to re-examine my convictions. And to edit my revelations. Because I realized... That I didn't understand very correctly the faith movement. And I'm not saying what we have been preaching has been wrong. That's not the point I'm making. I'm saying where our convictions have been hanging. Has not been taught.
thoroughly, thoroughly gathered by, by, the, by the Holy Spirit. Because I live a covenant life. I'm a priest. I understand the mysteries of priesthood. And by the message of God, I function by prophetic utterances. So things don't happen around me. I, I secure them in the spirit. And even when things want to happen, I change them. Because I know some things. And I live by them. But in recent times, I've had a few things happen that made me to be concerned. Even in, in the house here, we lost one of our dearly beloved leaders in the most unpleasant manner. And so I took time. When I come here, I said, no, don't preach. Come and help us preach first. Let me check what I know. And so for the past two weeks, I've not preached. I just sat down checking with the Lord and checking the scripture because I needed to hear something from the realm of God. And so the Lord kept quiet for a while. And so I had to go back to my theology and began to examine the scriptures while I waited for the Holy Ghost to speak. And the first thing the Holy Ghost showed me was the reality of the word of faith. Romans chapter 10 from verse 8. Glory to God. Can we project the scriptures very fast? I need people to read them. I need the scriptures read. Glory to God. He said, but what said it? The word is nigh, nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Next verse. That if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, he said, Thou shall be saved. In verse 10, he said, For with the mouth, for with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, the way we were taught the word of faith was that if you believe it and confess it, you will have it. And that is very true. But you see, what the Holy Ghost began to show me is the fact that the idea of the word of faith is not resolved. Because what we have believed about the word of faith for a long time is resolved. And so it was built around the power of God. And that's why everywhere you go to and there's a faith movement. It's about the doing God. The mighty God. And please hear me. That is very correct. But you see, if we don't get the whole syllabus correctly, many things will happen and many will lose their faith. If I have not encountered Jesus, maybe I wouldn't be preaching to you today. My faith would have been shattered. And so God began to show me that the idea behind the word of faith is not just about the power of God. It's that the word of faith movement actually is the lordship of Jesus Christ. It said the word of faith is not just the powerful God that does things, produces results, and makes our lives better. It said the whole ideology about the word of faith is that in all things, Jesus is Lord. And it said when Jesus is Lord, the first thing you will notice is that impossibilities will become possible. That is why I said in this scripture that God raised him from the dead. But you see, the subject is deeper than the God that turns impossibility around. Although part of the subject of the Lordship of Jesus is his power to change things. But there is another layer that will also define your conviction embedded therein which is not just the power of God, but also the wisdom of God. So while you are dealing with the power of God that changes situations around, in case you are in a situation that you don't get the results you are expecting, Jesus is still Lord. So in the word of faith movement, on one side, you encounter the power of Jesus that changes every situation around, including bringing the dead back to life. But on the other side is the wisdom of God. That in case you don't see what you are looking for, it doesn't mean Jesus is not powerful. 
It actually means the circumstances manipulating the affairs sometimes wants to draw your attention to something deeper than just answer. That's why Jesus is not just the power of God, but he is also the wisdom of God. So if you understand the word of faith from a complete syllabus, you will go out with all audacity to change situations. And like we see things happen here, you will change situations and turn them around. Nothing will be impossible unto you. But in case something happens that is beyond your ability, you will still say glory to God. That means your thanksgiving is not just based on what God does. Your thanksgiving is based on who God is. So God is able to do it. But in case he does not do it, he is still Lord. We don't come to God because of what he gives only. We come to God because of who he is. So Jesus is power and Jesus is wisdom. When the Holy Ghost began to reveal that to me, it made me understand that even where we don't get answer, it doesn't mean there's no answer. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13, it said, this died in faith. In verse 39, it said, not receiving the promise. So they didn't receive the promise, but they were still in faith. So God can change every situation, but in case there's a situation that has not changed, there's something you don't know. Jesus is still Lord. It is when God told me that, that I gained my courage back. And I decided we preach the word, not just because of our experience. We preach the word because the word is true. That's why I read this scripture. Heaven and earth shall pass away, not one jot of the word shall pass away. So if I pray for the blind, Jesus is able to open the blind eyes. But in case the eye does not open, Jesus is still Lord. If I pray for the deaf, Jesus is able to open the deaf ears. And I will insist for that ear to open. But in case the ear does not open, Jesus is still Lord. I will not hide what Jesus has not done and only project what Jesus has done. As though Jesus is powerful in some area and in the area that is not powerful in order for us not to be. <laughs> How many of you understand what I'm talking about? You know, the way we do it is that there are many things we see God do and we celebrate it. But the ones God did not do, we hide it as though we are trying to protect the image of our God. We are hiding it. As, you know, that's why we pray for the sick. It's only those who are healed we speak about. The ones who are not healed, it's as if uh, let's protect the name of our God. The Lord made me understand that he is able to answer to the uttermost. But where I have not seen answer yet, it doesn't mean he cannot. It means there is a wisdom beyond my level of growth, maturity and understanding. So Jesus is still Lord. When he told me that, I was, I was trying to thank him. And then I heard in my spirit, declare an anointing service. Empower the people to go and do more. Because this is a time to win more. And in case you don't win, go forward. Your movement and your advancement is not just based on answer. Your movement and your advancement is based on a truth that can never be denied. So if you preach Jesus to one and he's saved, celebrate him. If you preach to another and he's not saved, don't be discouraged. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. If you pray for one and he's healed, celebrate God. If you pray for the next one and he's not healed, don't be discouraged. Go to the next one. Keep praying. Your power to heal the sick is a testimony to the Lordship of Jesus. And in case the person is still not healed, the one that produced the body first is still Lord. And so the Lord mandated me tonight hear me see some of you have been trusting god for things and you've not received answers yet so you are moody you are depressed no even that answer you have not received is a message if only you can see the wisdom of god if only you can see the silence of god as a message in disguise and by the time you discern the wisdom of god you will now discover the answer will come glory to god so abraham trusted god for a child for 25 years, nothing happened. He crushed the threshold of disappointment. And he said, who against hope? Believed in hope. So he came to a point where it was not just about answer anymore. If he answers, his Lord. If he doesn't answer, his Lord. Because his power and his wisdom. And so on one side, we bask in the power. On another side, we bask in the wisdom. And so all together, Jesus is still Lord. 
hear the answer of the Hebrew boys? Our God is able to save us. But in case he does not save us, we will still not bow. That's word of faith. He is able to save. But in case he does not save, we will what? Not bow. See, many people have lost their faith and lost their Christianity because the people ask them, I thought you say your God is powerful. Where is he? Why have you not been healed? Why have you not gotten a child? Why has the church not grown? Our God is able to answer. But even if he does not answer, we will not bow. It is on this note that God has gathered us together tonight to demonstrate not just his power, but also his wisdom. Some of you, God will touch you tonight long-standing afflictions will be cancelled. And some of you, God will give you a wisdom to understand why that thing has not yet been answered. So that when you understand it, the answer will come. But the testimony will not just be the answer anymore. The testimony will be that you have known God in a deeper way. That is why the Bible said, Moses stepped into the deep darkness where God was. There are dimensions of God that are beyond his power. They are the wisdoms of God. So when you hear a Job say, even if you slay me, that's a level of faith that is not taught in the church. Even if you slay me, even if you don't answer, even if it does not work, you are still the Lord. There are kings. There are kingdoms. There, there are mountains. mountains. And there are thrones. Only Yeshua will reign forever. To your kingdom, there'll be no end. There are kings. There are kingdoms. There are kingdoms. There are mountains. There are mountains. this anointing service and while you were coming your neighbors told you you are still going for another one you have gone for 10 nothing has happened will you not rest it's not just about the answer our God is able to answer but even if he does not answer he is still the Lord you are deaf they say you have been sleeping in church you have not gotten the answer won't you rest it's not just about the ear it's about the lordship of jesus christ i have known him in the light and i have also known him in the dark i've known him where he answers and i've also known him where he does not answer i've known him in his power and i've also known him in his wisdom i have known him where he's almighty as the lion i've also known him where he's the lamb our God is able to answer. But in case he does not answer, he is still the Lord. Sit down for a moment. Sit down for a moment. I operate by revelation. This is why you will become like Mount Zion. That cannot be moved. I know you have not paid that debt. I know you have not taken in. I know you are not seeing yet. I know the ears have not yet opened. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. It is in his lordship that his power manifests. It is in his lordship that his wisdom also manifests. Embrace the boat and you will be a champion. How can people who didn't obtain the promise be called overcomers. That's to let you know that in this kingdom you cannot fail. You cannot be defeated. Because you must get it on this side. That's what you insist for. But in case you don't get it, there is another side. 
Because we who are in Christ, we don't die. We cross over. <laughs> we get it by all means. And every way out is a testimony. Glory to God. And so as you make demand on the anointing tonight, become shameless in representing Jesus. Some of you have not been able to manifest God because you are afraid. What if it does not happen? Even if it does not happen, he is Lord. This is what we make you to express the fullness of God that is in your heart, in your spirit and on your life. There is no such thing as discouragement in this kingdom. No matter what happens, you rise up and you keep moving. Because thy word, O Lord, is established in heaven forever. It is my duty to establish it on earth. And I will stand on the word. Come what may. At least let it be said concerning me that they died in faith. That's also a witness. There are kingdoms. There are mountains. And there are thrones. Only a the anointing because a generation is about to rise a fearless generation a shameless generation an undefilable generation that will take the devil head on until the kingdom of our God is established on the earth glory to God when you understand the dynamics of faith then you can operate in the corridors of the anointing. Now, there are four things about the anointing I want to share with you before we begin to enter the ministrations of the anointing. Number one, what is the anointing? Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 38. This scripture gives us the richest expression of the subject of the anointing. In this scripture, the one who represents the anointing is captured. The component of the anointing is captured. The authority of the anointing is captured. And the purpose of the anointing is captured. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. That's the person that symbolizes the anointing. Every time the word anointing is used in scripture, it's referring primarily to Christ. The anointed one and his anointing. He is the embodiment and the reflection of everything the anointing represents. So this scripture makes us understand that he took on the anointing. And he didn't stop there. He also gave us the component of the anointing. And he said he was anointed with what? The Holy Ghost and power. So the component of the anointing is first of all a person. And then the life force that flows out of that person. That's why when you read your Bible, especially in the New Testament context, you will see areas where the anointing is represented not just as a thing but as a being first john chapter 2 verse 20 you have an unction from the holy one and he said that anointing teaches you verse 27 a thing can teach so it makes you understand that this is not just a thing but a person first and the life force that flows from him so the component of the anointing is the holy spirit and the things that flow from him. Power is one of them. Wisdom is one of them. 
Grace is one of them. Favor is one of them. So when we are talking about the anointing, we are talking about the person of the spirit and all that flows from him. And then this scripture also shows us the authority of the anointing. It said when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, what did he do? He stopped the oppression of the devil. So the anointing has authority over everything that comes from the demonic realm. And then he also showed us the purpose of the anointing. Apart from destroying the works of the devil, is also to improve the quality of humanity. So when we are dealing with the subject of the anointing, it's important for us to understand primarily the constitutions of the anointing, the authority of the anointing, and the purpose of the anointing. The constitution of the anointing is the Holy Ghost and his life force. The authority of the anointing is his excellency in destroying Satan and everything that comes from his realm. And the primary purpose of the anointing is to improve the quality of humanity. That's why in Luke 4, 18, the moment Jesus was anointed, he began to read out the purpose of the anointing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach glad tidings. Luke 4, 18, to preach good news, the gospel to the poor. To, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. So anywhere people's life is not improved, the anointing is not there. Anywhere Satan's activities and oppression is not stopped, the anointing is not there. There are many people who are anointed, and they think the purpose of the anointing is to cause people, is to kill people. Is to subjugate, destroy people. They don't know the anointing. The goal of the anointing is to improve the quality of humanity. And the goal of the anointing is to stop the oppressions of darkness. This is what we are looking at tonight. And so what will come upon your life tonight will make you able to solve the problem of frustrated humanity. And it will also empower you to stop the agenda of Satan in your life in the life of those in your family, in the life of everybody that comes under the radar of your influence. This is why this service is very important because it's going to change your life forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, for the purpose of clarity, let me outline six benefits of the anointing as touching the errand of the anointing to improve humanity so that as you you know i'm going to teach you how to walk in the anointing because one of the laws that makes for walking in the anointing is consciousness that's why you need to know what the anointing is and you also need to know how to manifest the anointing do you follow because the anointing is a person the anointing is inside you and because the anointing is the life force of the spirit, the anointing is also upon you. So when you read your Bible, you are going to discover that there is the operation of the anointing within and there is the operation of the anointing upon. Let me read it before we proceed. First John chapter 2 verse 20. You see the anointing within. It says, but you have received an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. So this is not just a power to do something. This is something in you that educates you that trains you, that improves you. Verse 27, 1 John 2, 27. He said, but the anointing which you have received of him abided in you and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it has taught you, it shall abide in you. So this is a being that educates you. So the anointing within is designed to build intimacy between you and God and to engender transformation in your life. That's how that anointing helps you. So you can have the anointing within and not heal the sick. You can have the anointing within and not do exploit. The errand of that anointing is not to make you open blind eyes. The errand of that anointing is not to make you heal the sick. 
is to bring you into relationship with God. That's why you could not have been born again without the anointing. The anointing within is the precursor for the new birth. The Bible said, by one spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, are we all baptized into one body? That's the anointing within. That's a person walking on your inside. And so every one of us who is born again is anointed. But that dimension of the anointing is a person. That person is the one that convicts you of sin. That person is the one responsible for your transformation. That person is the one responsible for stirring hunger in you to love God and to walk with God. You have an unction from the Holy One. He abides on your inside. He is a person. But that's not all there is about the anointing. There is also the anointing upon. This one comes to enable you for service. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the world. This one will not transform you. This one is for service. It's for empowerment. That's why you see that somebody can raise the dead. Open blind eyes, but he's a fornicator. You know why? He's servicing the anointing upon, but not paying attention to the anointing within. So in dealing with the anointing, you must focus on both the anointing within and the anointing upon. The anointing within provokes intimacy with God, transformation, conviction from sin. But the anointing upon empowers you for exploit. Glory to God. We cannot do anything about the anointing within. But we can do something about the anointing upon. Because the anointing upon comes on you again and again and again. Acts 2 verse 1 and 2, they were anointed. Acts 4 verse 29 and 30, they were filled again with the Holy Ghost. It comes again and again to empower you. In this service, is the anointing upon that will be manifested. But there is something the world will do for you. It will stir the anointing within also to draw your attention to intimacy. Are you following this so far? Glory to God. And so every one of us seated here who is born again is already anointed. But you see, the anointing you may be operating with now is the one within. That's why you can't open blind eyes. That's why you cannot heal those who are crippled. That's why you cannot speak and circumstances change. What this service wants to do for you is to stir the outpouring of the anointing upon. So that as you walk out of this service, you can talk, changes will happen. You can speak, things will turn around. Because it is no longer by power, it is by the spirit at work on your inside. Glory to God. Now, for the purpose of consciousness and administration, let me show you six operations of the anointing. Or six errands of the anointing. So that when you begin to walk in the anointing, you will be mindful of these things. Because these are the things the anointing will do in your life. You need to know it. Glory to God. If I give you money, and I don't tell you what money is meant for, <laughs> you may do strange things with it. You may tear it. You may chew it. Or you may even use it as tissue paper. Meanwhile, that thing you are carrying in your hand has the capacity to stop you from trekking. It has the capacity to give you shelter. It has the capacity to put food on your table. But if you don't know the purpose, my son now, if I give him money, he'll be shocked. Even if it's $10,000, he will throw them around. And those who know the use, who, are not, who don't fear God, will look left and look right. If nobody is there, they will pack it. They will say, where is your father? Take your money. They know the use. The first thing is to go to Beirut to change. And change the money to something relevant. But the guy may not even feel anything. He has lost anything. Because he doesn't know the purpose. He doesn't know the errand. That's what's happening to many Christians. I, I will shock you here to let you know as I begin to show you how the anointing works. Some of you are heavily anointed. But you didn't know. So when it moves on your life, you'll just go and watch a movie. And say, Kai, this film is tough, oh. When it moves on your life, you, you, you go and use the energy to argue 
about football. And then you are arguing with an anointing. So your opponents keep quiet. You think it's because you know record. No, you don't know record. You, you spoke with an energy. So they were afraid. Don't you know that Messi is better than Ronaldo? The person said, yes. <laughs> I know. But he was seeing fire on your eyes. <laughs> this one is no longer football argument. Something was flowing through you. But you didn't know it was the anointing. Meanwhile, that's the anointing that should have raised 10 cripples. But because you don't know the purpose, you use it. <laughs> Somebody shout! Some of you here, listen. An anointing that should have made, made you enter the market and negotiated a lot of deals and broker deals in millions. It came upon your life. You went and sat down where they are playing draft. And you counter everybody with argument and they hailed you and said, Kai, Baba, you're too much, you're too much. And you left there, felt big. <laughs> that's, that's one billion that you just squandered. Because you don't know what came on you. You don't know. So it's important to understand the errand of the anointing. I use my own anointing to preach and to heal the sick. If you are in the marketplace, your own anointing is to preach and to do business. You must know how this thing works so that you make the most of it. You are a sportsman. Sometimes before you go to the field, stare the anointing. When you feel it, wear your boot and enter the field. That coach that says you will not play, when you see him, say good morning. <laughs> and look into his eyes. When he sees you, something. How are you? Come, come, come. Play the next match. You don't know how this realm works. But follow me for the next 40 minutes. Six errands of the anointing. Number one, the anointing consecrates and sanctifies. Anybody who carries the anointing is God's property. Touching is at your own detriment. Because the anointing is not just oil. You know, when we speak of the anointing, it's about the smearing of the oil of God. But it's beyond that. The purpose of the anointing is to make you God's property so that God can have a stake on your life. The reason you are attacked and angels respond, the reason you are attacked and heaven responds, is because there's an anointing on your life. So the jealousy of God is invested to defend you. That's why you are anointed. So that God can make claim over your soul. So that God can make claim over your life. And if you know this, when you are in trouble, you will look at yourself and say, I am anointed. Because you are anointed, the jealousy of God will defend you. Look at your scripture. In those days, when a priest is about to be consecrated, the only way you consecrate a priest is to put an anointing on his life. The moment that happens, that priest becomes God's property. He becomes a consecrated vessel unto God. That's how kings were ordained. You can be born a king. You can be prophesied a king. But if the anointing does not come on your life, you will never be a king. Because there will be no basis for God to place a demand or to have a stake on your life. Let's read the scriptures quickly. Exodus 28 verse 41. Manto paragatask. See, learn these things and let it form your consciousness. So that even when you are going through hell, tell yourself, God has got my back. I'm anointed. The idea of the anointing is not just for me to call myself a pastor. It's to consecrate me unto God. Nothing touches me and God keeps quiet. I am consecrated. That's why I am anointed. He said, and thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother, the garment now, and his sons with him. And thou shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister in the priest's office. Without the anointing, they are not God's ministers. Without the anointing, they are not God's property. But the moment that anointing comes upon them, if you touch them, you touch God. That's why in the New Testament, the whole church is anointed. Though. That was what God planned to do in the Old Testament, but they didn't know. He said he rebuked kings for their sakes. And he said, touch not my anointed. Who was he talking about? It was the whole church in the wilderness. So if they enter any city, you can't, you can't harm them. If they carry stones, they will win you. Not because they were skillful fighters. 
the jealousy of God was with them. And so when, 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 when Sihon, the king of the Amorite, and all the king of Bashan wanted to destroy Israel, <laughs> they told them there is a code about these people. There is a spirit hovering over them. You may not see him, but he's there. When you touch them, it's that spirit that will fight you. So one man can shout, and you see things go wrong. You won't know how. There's an anointing on their life. Touch them not. If you touch them, you provoke the anger of God. This is what the anointing has come to do in your life. You are not anointed so that you will sing in a choir. The anointing will enable you to sing in a choir, but it's deeper than that. You are not anointed so that you will be an eloquent preacher. You will preach, but it's deeper than that. You were anointed so that you become God's property. So that anything that touches you, there will be legitimacy in the spirit for the spirit realm to respond on your account. Why do you think Jesus appeared to Paul on his way to Damascus? So, so, why persecutors down me? So was never attacking Jesus. But when you attack the church, you attack Jesus. His anointing is on their life. They are part of his body. You see anointed men afraid. So fearful. When things happen to people, we are the first to take over. That means we don't know what we carry. I'm not saying be careless. But there is an insurance system around you. It's called the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Are you aware there's something on your life? When Saul died, David stood up. Second Samuel 1 verse 20 and 21. He said, Cursed be the mountains of Giboah. He said, You were quiet in the day that the Lord's anointed fell. David knew this thing so much that he knew that mountains were supposed to rise up to fight. Because it's not a, it's not, it's a possibility. When, when Israel wanted to fight in the days of Deborah, the Bible said the stars were spawning their enemies. The constellation can rise up to defend an anointed man. So David caused the mountain that was present that did nothing. And David lamented. He said, how did this man fall as though he was not anointed? That means things don't happen to anointed men. If you know what you carry, he said, how did he fall as though he was not anointed? Hear me, brothers and sisters. I declare unto you from today, the jealousy of God is your defense. Christianity is not a religion. There's religion in Christianity. But Christianity is not a religion. It's divinity expressed through humanity. There's something about us. We are not ordinary. The world may not know it, but we must know it if we will manifest it. When they threaten you, tell them they are wasting their time. Even when you don't know, the jealousy of God will fight. When Balaam was summoned to curse Israel, what happened? They were not aware. They were not even praying. The guy did all the rituals. He showed up. He said, how beautiful are thy tents, O Israel. This is the man who came to destroy. Was now singing their praise. How beautiful are thy tents, O Israel. And the king was wondering, I brought you here to curse them. Why are you prophesying and blessing them? He said, there's no enchantment against Israel. There's no divination against them. The shout of the king is in their midst. It's not about their military prowess. There is something that covers them. There is something that defends them. I prophesy over you. Because of the anointing, from this moment, you'll become invincible. It's the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. Yeah.
ministers, I'm there. When you number God's family, I am there. And when you count God's properties, I'm also there. Because the anointing makes me a part and parcel of the divine. Sit down for a moment. The second errand of the anointing is to enthrone you. We are not slaves. We are nobles. We are royals. We are kings and princes of a kingdom and of a dispensation. But what made that possible is the instrument of the anointing. Second Samuel. Even if it's prophesied that you are a king, until the anointing comes upon you, you will not be one. The anointing is an instrument of enthronement. Second Samuel 2 4 and Second Samuel 5 3. David was anointed three times. First, before his family, second, before Judah, third, before Israel. And all of them gave him rank. The moment he was anointed before his family, he became the firstborn. The brothers didn't know. <laughs> they thought he was a young lad. It was when they met Goliath that they knew that this thing is not about age or height. Because Eliab shows up as a macho man. He thought he was still the leader of the clan. When they confronted Goliath, that was when they discovered that even Saul was behind David. Saul that was head and shoulder above Israel. When Goliath came, he was like a mountain. They needed something that was more mystical than human height to fight. That was when the real elder brother showed up. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defiled the armies of God? Who is this one? David was now speaking from the corridor of the covenant and the anointing. And David walked up to the Goliath that the whole army was afraid of. He said, hear me. Today I will cut off your head. The birds of the air will eat you up. The question is, which weapon will you use? There was no weapon in his hand. And Goliath was wondering, what strategy of war is this? Or did you bring this boy to insult me? And the Bible said, Goliath cursed him with his gods. Because even Goliath was not fighting by height. He was fighting by the oracles of his spirit. He cursed David with his God. But David knew the one that anointed him was superior to all the gods, all the kings, and all the dominions. And the Bible says, David charged at Goliath. Kakato, he charged at him. And the Bible said, he brought him down with a sling. And he took his own sword, cut off his head. The whole army fled because a ranking man by the anointing had shown up. I prophesy over you. The force that enthrones, the force that exhausts by the anointing, it rests upon you now. Creation, Yahweh is it. We release, we release the sound of the heavens, sound of creation. Yahweh is We cry holy, 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 holy unto Yeshua. Yahweh. be rejected you may have been undermined do you know in David's family they didn't even count him as one of the sons when the king showed up bring all your sons they brought seven and left David 
You may be smelling like the animals that you have been keeping. But when the anointing shows up, it has a power to put a crown on your head and a scepter in your hand. Now I prophesy over you. Because of the anointing, because of the grace, the power that the anointing brings, step into your realm of dominion now. Step into your realm of dominion now. Carry your scepter. Carry your crown. Step on your throne. Time is a burden. Sit down for a moment. The first thing the anointing does is to consecrate you unto God. The second thing the anointing does is to enthrone you and bring you into the realms of dominion. He said, where the word of the king is, there is power. Who can say unto him, what doest thou? Brothers and sisters, when we were anointed, we were enthroned. And this anointing keeps coming in layers. In layers. In layers. In 2 Samuel 2 verse 4, David was anointed again. And he became king over Judah. But that was not all. He kept operating at that level. And then in 2 Samuel 5 verse 3, he was anointed again as king over Israel. Some of you had an anointing. Your family was looking up to you. That's good. But it's time to come up. It's time to come up. Now your state needs to look up to you. Your country needs to look up to you. Your continent needs to look up to you. Your generation needs to look up to you. And in the name of Jesus, I make both to declare, let a fresh anointing come upon your life now. He said, my horn, O oh God, thou hast exalted as the horn of the unicorn. For you have anointed me with a fresh oil. In the name of Jesus, receive a fresh oil upon your life now. <laughs> Sit down for a moment. Please hear me. Don't let the devil distract you. Oh, you are not tall. Oh, you are not a man. Oh, you are not fine complexion. Oh, you didn't school well. Brothers, all of that is secondary. It doesn't matter your complexion. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your height. In the days of Deborah, women didn't even talk. Let alone being part of the army. But the woman rose up. <laughs> when the anointing comes on your life, it makes you a wonder. It makes you a wonder. And the Bible said, in the days of Shamgar, it was supposed to be another man. But a woman rose up as a judge in Israel. As a judge. She came in the order of Samson. She came in the order of Gideon. She came in the order of all the judges of Israel. And she did not just rise as a judge. She called herself a mother in Israel. Because when the anointing comes, you can't argue. You know what the anointing did with Deborah? She didn't just lead the army. Even the constellations were fighting on the side of Israel because a woman who carried something and was aware rose up from today everything that appeared as a limitation in your life will become the platform for your manifestation it will become the platform for your manifestation if they say you are a stammerer that's why you become an extraordinary preacher if they say you are not educated that's why you become their leader if they say you are a woman that's why you will be set apart in the name of Jesus Christ. Lift your right hand. I'm seeing somebody receive something like a sword in the spirit. A new order has opened. One that will lead a generation like a captain in the army of God. I see a sword in the spirit. Whoever that one is, 
now I decree by the power of the spirit by the power of the ages to come step into a new ranking in the spirit step into a new order in the spirit carry that grace now I shall accept that one for me sit down for a moment bring that person to the altar keep him under the cloud you will never be the same again drum of warriors the sound of warriors hey back up a katekaya zereka bakatoa mekoroto parakata i come to you as one sent in the order in the clan of the warriors of the spirit i blast the shofar on cloud on line come on hida come on hida the dance of mahanai the sounds of the warriors of the spirit. Make up our capacity. Bakoda, Bakoda. Watch us. Keep us. Custodians. Guardians. Others of warriors. Mero Bakabakato. of nations we open some of you will step into territories demonic warriors and priests will run out of those cities because the anointing on your life has moved to become a radar it will come like a cloud the bible said because somewhere was in Nayot in Rama everybody that stepped into that city came under that cloud so much so that when Saul wanted to arrest somewhere a battalion of soldiers came they went under the anointing another battalion came they went under the anointing until saw himself showed up the bible said the moment he stepped into night he began to prophesy and he prophesied naked from night to day i declare over you anointings that subdue territories anointing that take over system he rest upon you now Yeah, 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 yeah
sit down for a moment. We need to step down so we can journey. Number three, errand of the anointing is to bless and prosper. Please hear me. There is a universal dimension of prosperity. We never speak against it. We never negate it. We know it. We engage it. Where you can become wealthy through investments. Where you can become wealthy through gifts and talents. Where you can become wealthy through production. Wisdom of productivity. You produce something, sell it. Or where you can become wealthy through inheritances. But trust me, there is a dimension of blessing that comes upon you. You don't just have money. You have what money can buy and you also have what money cannot buy. When you prosper by the anointing, you will have what money can buy, you will have what money cannot buy and you will have money itself. That's the dimension of blessing that the anointing brings. And when the anointing blesses and prospers, there are four things it does. Number one, it brings beauty to your life. So much beauty and excellence that people don't, they just love you. Not because of what you have. There's an aroma that your life commands that makes people want to come to you, relate with you, and give you of their substance. How do you think men were selling their properties and bringing the possession to the apostles' feet? Acts chapter 4 verse 34 to 36 it was an oil there was no record that they preached prosperity there was no record that they told people oh sell bring there was something on their lives that occasioned it there's a beauty that the anointing gives you that you become like the illumination of a generation Psalm 132 verse 17 if you have New Living Translation, it says here, I will increase the power of David. My anointed one will be light for my people. I will increase the power of David. My anointed one, he said it will be the light. Something that attracts the attention of everybody. No wonder Second Chronicles chapter 9 from verse 22 to 24 the Bible says all the kings of the earth they came to David. He was a king like them but there was something about his life. All the kings of the earth came to him. They listened to his wisdom and they say everyone that came came with loads of gold and silver. 2nd Chronicles 9 verse 22 to 24 they were coming with camels loaded with gold and silver just to give the man and King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom and anointing sponsoring it and all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon what was it about him that other kings were looking for there was a fragrance there was an oil. You are a businessman. Every other businessman wants to affiliate with you. You are a pastor. Every other pastor wants to affiliate with you. You are a lead, a, a, a government agent, a politician. Every other politician. They don't even know why. Something is on your life. Those of us in Africa here, we know what they do in darkness. There are some politicians that when time for election drop close, they can go as far as killing virgins. And they give them to a stick. Chew it before you go out. If they chew it, if they stand, even if they are making grammatical blunder, it will become a trend. And people will be laughing over what they should re be, be reproaching the person. But he has chewed something. He has beaten something. But what we carry in light is superior to darkness. Hear me, brothers and sisters, from today. Anywhere you go, you will become the symbol of favor. Anywhere you go, men will sought to associate with you. When David was anointed, the Bible said daily, men joined themselves to David until his host 
became like the host of God. People of, and these were not useless people. When the Bible spoke about them, some of them, the Bible said they Gadites. It said their faces were like lions. It said these were men of war. It said some of them moved upon the mountains like gazelles. These are warriors in their own right. But they came and submitted themselves to David because of what was oozing out of his life. How can you have business and you are looking for men? How can you have an, a, a, a company and you are looking for people? I decree over you from today. The anointing that beautifies. The anointing that adds fragrance to the lives of people. It rests upon you now. Glory to God. Sit down. When the anointing blesses and prospers, it gives you visibility and relevance. So this prosperity is not that you are in obscurity. Things are happening. Did you read about Jesus? Luke 4. Matthew 3 from verse 17 first. The Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, Below, Behold, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He was 30 years old. He was the son of God. He had been on earth. Everybody knew him. But the anointing had not come. The moment the anointing came, the Bible said, Matthew 4.1, he was driven to the wilderness to be tempted. As he returned, Matthew 4.15, the land of Zebulun, from verse 14, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, he said the people that sat in darkness saw a great light. That's beauty. Number two, verse 15, he said, and his fame went abroad. Anything you do, they, your generation will look for it. When an anointing comes on your life, even when you crack joke, it will be a trend. Not because you are looking for it. Listen, let me explain something to you. If you begin to pursue visibility, you are falling. Because you are looking for something that will add to vain glory. But in the same light, you cannot advance God's kingdom without visibility. So God himself, by the anointing, gives visibility to his servants. The Bible said concerning Jesus, he said his fame went abroad. There are many things you can't do unless God gives you influence over your generation. If you don't have it, you will struggle. So when the anointing comes upon a man's life, one of the things he does is that he noises everything he does abroad. That's why your voice will be heard. That's why your ministry will become a dominant factor in your generation. That's why your business will prosper. And so when we are talking about the anointing, please don't think it's something that comes upon your life and you too begin to lay hands on the sick. That is part of it, but it's more than it. When the anointing comes upon your life, nothing you do can be put in obscurity. The anointing has a system of amplifying everything you do. And it's on the strength of that that you become relevant in God's agenda. So the second way the anointing triggers blessings and prosperity is to bring influence and visibility. The third way the anointing prospers you is by breaking every yoke of the devil in your life. Because the devil is a master in limiting people. And one of the ways he limits people is to put yokes on their lives and on their enterprises. But in Isaiah 10 27, the Bible said, the yoke is broken, the burden is lifted off your shoulders because of the anointing. Acts 10 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. So the anointing specializes in breaking yokes. This is why the presence of the devil can no longer limit your advancement. Because there is something on your life that stops the oppression of the devil. He is called the anointing. Listen, if you know the battles anointed men fight, you will be afraid. The reason they never go down is because there is a support structure. It does not only strengthen them, it also counters what Satan does. And sometimes what the devil plans for evil, the anointing changes it for your good. Glory to God. A few months ago, I was in Lagos to preach for one of God's dear servant, 
Pastor Shola Shumakinde. One day to conference, Satan came, burned the church down to ashes. In 24 hours, what came into the church was bigger than what they had. As I'm talking to you now, an ultra modern facility has been erected. Church is marching on. They have greater visibility, greater finances, greater acceptance, and the conference was a huge success. People, he told me, he said, people he never had the opportunity to meet were calling him by themselves and said, Man of God, how are you doing? Please, can we see? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> he said, This devil meant it for evil, but God turned it for good. That's how the anointing works. See, hear me. Anything the devil is doing in your life, don't give him the advantage by crying. Don't give him the advantage by saying negative things. Oh, I'm finished, not you. When the devil does it, tell yourself, although the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. Gather together, you will scatter. Take counsel together, it shall come to none. Our God is in our midst. The Bible said he frustrated the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. Come on, somebody, you stare that anointing. And what the devil meant for evil becomes the platform for your glorification. When the anointing blesses and prospers, it breaks the yokes of the devil. And finally, when the anointing blesses and prospers, it gives you wisdom. Wisdom beyond your age. I read for you already from 2 Chronicles 9, 22 to 24. They came because of the wisdom of Solomon. And it was the anointing that sponsored it. And everyone who came, came with a lot of wealth. Does it not surprise you? David fought 66 battles. Solomon didn't fight one. All of them were champions. There's a dimension of the anointing that makes you to do valiant things. And there's also a dimension of the anointing through wisdom that makes even your enemies to be at peace with you. All of them is victory. Yeah. enter how to stir the anointing that's where the message should have begun from because it's not enough to know what the anointing can do you need to know how to administer it ah let's see how god helps us fourth errand of the anointing is for empowerment empowerment for service when the anointing comes on your life listen ministry is hard serving god is difficult but the reason we are doing it from the place of rest is because an anointing is empowering us. If the grace of God is withdrawn, you will die. It won't take one week, you will go down. From your schedules, to the attacks from Satan, to the attacks from wicked men. Sometimes the men that want you to go down are more numerous than demons. See, some people are just watching to hear bad news. So that they will say, we said it. It has just begun. But you know what the anointing does? It turns everything around for your good. So before they talk, something, another glory is added. Before they talk, another glory is added. And they are looking at you. Your life becomes a difficult puzzle. I prophesy over you. You become a wonder in your world. We 
need to step down. Let me step down so that I can teach some a little. Let me cover some grounds in 15 minutes. Then we'll do the anointing service. There are two dimensions of empowerment that the anointing brings. Number one is empowerment to be a witness. And number two is empowerment for mighty works. When a man is anointed, these two things, you will see it. It happens like play. When they talk, people believe them as though they are using... The anointing is stronger than the charm. So if I say as if they are using charm, it's an understatement. When, did you not hear? The moment the Holy Ghost came upon them on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, the Bible said in verse 16, Peter stood up. <laughs> A man who Jesus left 40 days said nothing. Suddenly, Holy Ghost came upon them. And in verse 16, Peter stood up and began to tell them, this is what prof the, prof the prophet Joel spoke about. In the last day, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Go and read that scripture and tell me the strange thing Peter said there. But when he was done talking, in verse 37, the Bible said their hearts were pricked. What touched their heart? It was the anointing. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? You would think it's five people. When they finished counting those who surrendered, verse 41, they were 3,000. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, same thing happened. Spoke casually, 5,000 added to the church. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, a great company of the priests, even the critics, the anointing had a way of witnessing to them. They joined the faith. Acts chapter 8, from verse 5, it became difficult for church to go out. They started sending individuals to cities. And the Bible said Philip went to Samaria. He shut the city down. By the same anointing, Acts 13, 44, Paul went to a city. He shut it down. And in Paul's case, he became a normal thing. If you read Acts of the Apostles, let me read one for you quickly. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 19, verse 26. Hear what they said about Paul. See, if you are not witnessing for Christ, you are not putting your anointing to work. Don't bother about how you will say it. When you are talking to the people's head, the anointing talks to their heart. That's the one that convicts them. You can go to a place and just say, Jesus died for you. And you'll be shocked what will happen. That was the greatest shock Peter discovered in Acts 10 44. He was just telling them about Jesus Christ that they crucified. The Holy Ghost fell on the people. They began to speak in tongues. Because the anointing is the power for witness. Look at what this guy said here. Paul went to Ephesus and shut down the whole city. Because they were worshipping Diana. And there were people who were doing all kinds of sculptures representing different gods. They saw that their business was failing. So they wanted to gang up against Paul. Now see what they said. Their testimony is my emphasis. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no God which, made, which was made with hand. One man shut down the whole Asian region. That's the anointing. How can you say you are anointed? All your life, you have not won up to 10 souls. You don't know what the anointing is. If the anointing comes on your life, it will give you boldness and prompt you to go out and preach Christ. And when you preach Christ, either by words or by signs and wonders, one way or the other, the anointing must make sure you become a witness. That's why Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power and you shall be witnesses unto me. So anybody who is anointed automatically becomes a witness. The second empowerment is for mighty works. The moment the anointing came upon their lives, hope you know these guys didn't go to school of the miraculous. They didn't go to school of the prophetic. They, they were just anointed. Acts 2, they were anointed. The next thing, Acts chapter 3, they were entering the place of prayer. Verse 6, the man at the beautiful gate asked for help, looking at them, hoping to receive money, which was what everybody gave. Peter said, look on us. Silver and gold have I known. Such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. 
the man couldn't stand up. Peter knew he had something. The Bible said he held him and pulled him up. Oga, get up. I say, rise up. So even when nothing was happening, there was an audacity. And the Bible said, as Peter pulled him up, he said his ankle received strength. What was that? The anointing. Acts chapter 5 verse 15, shadow began to heal the sick. It's no more pulling people up. The anointing began to flow through everything. Listen, we are not religious folks. Our goal is not to be part of a denomination and feed the auditorium. Our goal is to go to all the worlds and produce wonders so that the kingdoms of this world becomes the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. You can be a banker, carry wonders there. You can be a teacher, carry wonders there. You can be a businessman, carry wonders there. And you'll be shocked how the anointing will mop up with your business and the business itself will become a witness. We are not taught the purpose of what we have. That's why most of us who are anointed, we think anointing is all about coming to church service and doing something inside church. It's bigger, far bigger than that. The anointing consecrates you to God. You are God's property. His jealousy is on your life. If you know it, nothing can happen to you. The anointing does not just consecrate you to God. The anointing also enthrones you as a ruler. So you are a being of authority. When you talk, things happen. The anointing does not just enthrone you. The anointing also brings you blessings and prosperity. You cannot lack. You cannot be defeated. You are anointed. And that's not all. The anointing also empowers you. First, as a witness. Then, as a worker of mighty works. Please, become bold. You carry something that has been dormant for too long. When there's nobody to talk, rise up, talk. And even you will be shocked what God will do. If there's nobody to pray for the sick, rise up. If there's nobody to go represent God in any sector that you have an open door, enter there. The Bible says, don't even bother what you will say. Open your mouth. He say, I will fill it with words. You think all I've been telling you here, I read them. Am I a computer? It's the anointing. And when you enter the realm of mighty works, even you begin to enjoy it. I thought I was grieving. And I went to Calabar. The first thing is that the anointing drew a crowd of people. When I entered the hall and I saw them, immediately I put myself in order. I say, a light has come. I entered like a priest. When I stood and I started talking, while I was here talking, the anointing began to hit people. My boldness went up. When I finished talking, I stood like a ruler. I said, now I want to give commandments. <laughs> I want to write laws. I want to write. <laughs> I said, if you are here and you are bound by Satan, I come as a prince from heaven. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, I break the chain. You needed to have been in that auditorium. It was like they connected high tension wire on people. Demons crying out from everywhere. I stood, I looked. I said, anybody who came here sick, now, I refuse that you step out with that sickness. Drop it here. In the name of Jesus, <laughs> I became a commander. And people came up. One came with an x-ray. An x-ray of a heart condition. Something that was supposed to be a threat to, to life. We were playing with it. I flung, I flung it somewhere and said, come, let's talk serious matter. Because the anointing. And we are kindergartens in this matter. Go online and check A.A. Allen. You will understand what I'm trying to teach. They brought a boy. The boy's leg was like rubber. I'm not saying, let's go and go to the mountain. No, in your face, leg was like rope. He held it. Say, come on, stretch your hands in this direction. I said, Lord, help this man. Help this man. Help this man. What is he trying to do? They prayed for less than 10 seconds. I don't even know if he, if he, maybe he just wanted them to pray so that they would say we prayed. Because I doubt if he waited for that prayer. Less than 10 seconds. The next thing, he carried the boy. When he was bringing him down, I said, wait, wait, wait. 
leg stood on the ground. The next thing you heard, crack, 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 bone came. As thou knowest not how bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child, so also knowest not thou the ways of the spirit. Bones. The boy began to walk. Somebody that in seconds you saw legs like rubber. That's the anointing. I watched or a robot. They bring people. In some case, when he's done preaching, there's nothing like atmosphere. He will sit down and the sick will queue up. He said, I feel the anointing on my hand. When I touch you, you're going to be healed. <laughs> they brought somebody blind, stuck blind. He said, sit here. Now, in the name of Jesus, he put the hand there. He removed it. While we were seeing, eyes appeared. I can see, I can see. What's going on here? Is the excellency of the anointing. The anointing will make you a wonder. See, many people think, oh, miracles are fake. They don't know the anointing. Every time you say miracles are not real, you are insulting the name of Jesus and the anointing. Because so long as the name of Jesus is still valid and the anointing is still on earth, miracles will remain a byproduct. They say these things because they think they are attacking men. They don't know they are attacking the veracity of the word, the name, and the anointing. Every one of you sitting here that is born again, you have an anointing on your inside already. And you already have anointing on your life. All you need to do is to grow that anointing and put it to work. In the next five minutes, let me show you two ways of receiving the anointing and two ways of growing the anointing. So we begin to pray. How do you receive the anointing? Number one, you receive the anointing by receiving the anointed one. The anointing can't come on your life unless you receive the anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one. The name Christ is, is the name Christos. And it was a transliteration from the name Mashiach. And that name is for the messenger that is to come. And Jesus is the Christ. So anybody who receives Jesus immediately the anointing enters his life. That's why I quoted for you already from 1 Corinthians 12 13 it said by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So it's the anointing that brings you into Christ. You can't be born again without the anointing. So if you want to be consecrated unto God, if you want to be blessed and prosperous, if you want to be empowered for mighty works, if you want to carry the protection of God you must become anointed and the first way to be anointed is to receive Christ the second way to be anointed is to glorify Christ receiving Christ brings the anointing within glorifying Christ bring the anointing upon the Holy Ghost only moves in the direction where Jesus is glorified that's why the Bible said in John 7 38 and 39 it said they that believe out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. He said, but he was speaking of the spirit and the spirit has not yet been given because Christ has not yet been glorified. The moment you begin to glorify Christ, the Holy Ghost begins to anoint you. The Bible speaking in John 16, 13, he said, how be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all realities. He shall not speak of himself. He shall speak of me and all that he has heard. So the work of the Holy Ghost only happens where Christ is glorified. This is why the greatest anointings on earth are seen where Christ is preached and where Christ is glorified. It may be very simple, but the outcome is mind-blowing. I followed many evangelists. Sometimes they are preaching, I'm sleeping. But when they say in the name of Jesus, even the dead comes back to life. Because if Christ is glorified, the anointing moves. The anointing moves. And if I may add, the third way to increase the anointing upon is by the laying on of hands. Everywhere an anointed person lays hands, the Holy Ghost traffics. The reason we are able to bless is because the Holy Ghost responds when we carry out these ordinances. Acts 19 from verse 1 to 6, Paul met some disciples and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we have not as much as heard of him. All they knew was John's baptism. And the Bible said, Paul told them about Christ and he laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they prophesied. So laying on of hands is a system, a mystery in the kingdom that occasions the transfer of the anointing. Glory to God. 
So tonight, even as hands are laid here, most of you will step into dimensions of anointings that you have not seen before. Because there is both a personal anointing here and a corporate anointing. And then somebody is watching online and they say, but I'm not on ground. How can hands be laid on me? When the word is preached, the anointing also is released. Luke 10, 17. Jesus was preaching. The power of God was present to heal. Everywhere prophetic words are released. The reason they are able to produce results is because the anointing travels in that direction. So when we make declarations, the reason they come to pass is because the anointing travels in that direction. People who are AS changes to, to AA. People who are poor, all of a sudden, they break into wealth. People who are sick and dying, suddenly they rise up and things begin to work. You think it's because of eloquence? Paul said, when I came unto you, I did not come with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the counsel of God. Excellent speech cannot change anything. It takes an anointed speech to change things. And when you preach the word, you release the anointing. John 6, 63, the words I speak, they are not Aramaic. You may hear them in the likeness of Aramaic, it says, but they are spirit and they are life. That's how you receive the anointing. By receiving Christ, by glorifying Christ, by hands being laid upon you, and by receiving the word with faith and meekness. And you see that the anointing comes upon your life. Now when you receive the anointing, it blesses you. For you also to administer the anointing, there is a protocol. And I don't have time to deal with it. But let me give you one. The first protocol is the protocol of stirring. The anointing is likened to oil. And like oil can congeal, the anointing on your life too can congeal. Most of you are anointed, but because you don't stir it and put it to work, that's why it looks as if you are not anointed. So when things happen to you negatively, that the anointing should have defended you, it didn't defend you because it's not stirred. When you go to a place where you are supposed to enjoy blessings and you are not enjoying, it's because you are not stirred. Anybody who knows how the anointing works will keep himself stirred all day long because you don't know when you will need it. How do you stir the anointing? Number one is by sustaining a consciousness of the anointing. If you don't sustain the consciousness that you are anointed, you may be anointed, it will not work. Luke 4 18 Jesus showed up before he said he came to bring healing he came to deliver those who are oppressed he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me it's not it's upon all of us I don't know about you but the spirit of the Lord is where it's upon me he has anointed me too so before you act make sure you have the consciousness of the anointing and don't just have the consciousness acknowledge it acknowledge it. The Bible said in Philemon 1.6 that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing in you, including the anointing. When Saul was looking for his father's missing axis in 1 Samuel 9, he came to Samuel. He said, we are looking for, they told us there's a prophet. Samuel said, I am the seer. It's not pride. It's acknowledging what you carry. Go and read the Pauline epistles, he never introduced himself without declaring who he was. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God the Father. <laughs> and Timothy, let Timothy introduce himself. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Timothy calls himself, but what? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ and sustenance. Let sustenance introduce himself. But me, I am an apostle. I am a teacher. I am a preacher. What anointing do you carry? Have you considered it? Are you conscious of it? Have you acknowledged it? Some of you carry anointing to be leaders. But you have never called yourself a leader. You are moving from church to church. Asking for prayer. Which is good. But have you ever stood and said, Nigeria, I must manifest over you. We carry the key for your deliverance. And not too long from now, we shall be enthroned to bring our witness. Have you done that? You have an anointing to be a mighty man in the economic corridor. 
When last have you sat down to say, I lay up gold as dust. There's an anointing for wealth on my life. I cannot walk in lack. What I'm going through is a process. Not too long from now, I will borrow to nations. I will borrow to system. I will borrow to organization. That's how the anointing works. Jesus acknowledged he was anointed. Paul acknowledged he was anointed. Every prophet acknowledges that they are anointed prophets. You are the only one who thinks it's pride to say it. When God called me to be an apostle, I waited because I was under a system for me to be ordained. Because I didn't just want to jump out in rebellion. Let the body of Christ acknowledge it. Now, when I was ordained, the prophet that ordained me came to me and said, God told me to ordain you an apostle. That same evening, another evangelist stood up, called me on the altar and said, God told me to tell you that your apostolic ministry, they will pack seat people in lorries. Every other person went by the title of reverend. I went by my ordination. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you. They told me I'm ordained an apostle. Jesus told me before. The body of Christ confirmed me. I, see, you know, those of you who are here, hope you know in 2018, 2019, you hardly see young men call themselves an apostles. When I say I'm an apostle, I discovered many other young apostles woke up and say, I'm way to What's happening with this guy? Could it be that he acknowledges on the nation? Everyone who is an apostle too began to call himself. If you joke, you'll be going nowhere. You are an apostle. If you say for the purpose of modesty, let me call myself a pastor. You are joking. Pastor has their own graces. Apostles have their own graces. I'm traveling from nation to nation. I'm confronting territorial spirits. I'm confronting principalities. You want me to call myself a pastor who is just over people when I need the defenses of the apostolic office? Where will it come from if I don't acknowledge that I'm an apostle? Some people call me and say, no, now, why are you calling yourself an apostle? I say, no, Jesus told me I'm an apostle. I waited to be ordained an apostle. That's why I'm calling myself an apostle. I'm not pursuing a title. I'm conscious of my ordination. Because if I don't acknowledge that office and I start doing the works of that office, when the battles of that office comes, I will be cut off. Samuel said, I am the seer. Consciousness and acknowledgement. You're under a system where to be ordained. But when you are ordained and your office is acknowledged, don't be afraid of calling yourself. It's not pride. Every office is a work. And there's an anointing to empower you to do it. If you don't acknowledge it, you won't do it. Why do you think we are moving from nations to nations with ease? We are pioneering centers everywhere with ease. Ease the office. And I acknowledge it. Some of you will live here with an anointing for wealth. If you like, don't acknowledge it. Some of you will live here with anointing for governmental power. If you like, don't acknowledge it. Some of you will live here with anointing to create, to produce, for investment. If you like, don't acknowledge me. But as for me and my family, give the Lord the show. to finish my teaching we are under staring there are many things under staring you know, because you have staring then you have engagement then you have preservation of the oil so you stare the oil you engage the oil and you preserve the oil because the oil you can be corrupt from using the oil so these are three very important protocols but I have only time to deal with staring Stay it through consciousness. Stay it through acknowledgement. And then stay it by putting yourself in remembrance of all the anointing has been doing. Sometimes go and sit down. Watch the videos of what God has done through you. Listen to the testimonies. And then also listen to what God is doing in the life of other people. You are being reminded of what the anointing does. There are times when I become dangerously anointed just by watching Pastor Chris, just by watching Benny Hinn,
just by watching Jaco, just by watching A.A. Allen, and I'm seeing the way they are messing demons up, messing sickness up, I come with a staring. Because when you remember what the anointing does, you stir the anointing. Glory to God. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.13 Hear what Peter told the church. Why do you think some of you, your anointing is dull? You're only watching bad news on CNN, on BBC. And then all the gossip, they are gossiping you. You go here. They say, imagine what this person said. You say, they don't know me, that's why. If only they knew me, they would know I'm not like this. And they are punching arrows into your soul. Punching arrows. A point come, you are so depressed. You can no longer rise. I learned something from Bishop Oedepo many years ago. He said, no retreat, no attack. Since they have time to speak about you, let them be speaking. Those who make news, don't talk. It's those who watch that talk. So let them watch you on your page and make comment. Some people are not doing anything in their generation. But they are surfing the internet. Looking for those making impact. And they hang on the comment box with weapons. Like Gazelle. They carry Microsoft Word. They carry AI. They carry Google. They are searching words and writing three ties, correcting doctrine, attacking your character. Meanwhile, they are on comment box. And when they finish writing, they are waiting for any notification. If anybody comment, they come back and respond to that one. That's why they are in the comment box. When men are taking nations for God, taking territories for God, somebody is looking for one sentence in a three hours message. You don't have work. Keep searching. Very soon they will add you to encyclopedia. You will become one of their search engines. Why those who are making impact will be making impact. Don't waste your time with such things. They can say what they want. So long as the Holy Ghost bears witness. The word of God bears witness. Those you are accountable to. Because you know they know better than you. And ahead of you bear witness. Don't bother about any critic. Any bitter person. Who is angry because he can't succeed and he wants to put down everybody succeeding don't waste your time put yourself in remembrance see what peter say he say yeah i think it meet as long as i am in this tabernacle to stir you up how by putting you in remembrance that means when you remember the things god does in your life and what he's doing in the life of others there's a way it stirs your own anointing I can go for a miracle service by praying a short prayer and watching Benny Hinn. And I see some dangerous miracles sometimes that I don't have faith for. But because the Holy Ghost showed me what he could do in Benny Hinn, when I show up, I believe him for the same thing. And the same Holy Ghost who did it in Benny Hinn's life comes up into my own meeting and begins to do it. The anointing stares. That's why you must be careful what you allow into your system. Number four, how do you stare the anointing? You stare the anointing. Mm. My God. By prayer and worship. Second Timothy 1 verse 6. This law I give unto you, dear son Timothy, that you find to flame the gifts of God that were put in you by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. You find it to flame. How do you do that? Jude verse 20. Building up yourself upon your most holy faith, upon the graces of God that is on your life by praying in the Holy Ghost. So if you are not praying, be worshipping. I think it's Second Kings now, chapter 3, verse 15. Elisha wanted to prophesy and he said, bring the minstrel for me. There's something worship does to the oil. And as the minstrel began to play, the prophetic anointing began to flow. Be, see, I tell you, life in the spirit is a labor. Most of you think things just happen. That's why you just appear, you are hoping things will happen. All of the possibilities of the anointing will not happen in your life if you are not conscious about stirring the anointing. There are dimensions that only prayer and worship can stir. There are dimensions that only remembrance can stir. There are dimensions that only consciousness can stir. And there are dimensions that only acknowledgement can stir. And finally, to stir the anointing is by meditating on the word of God. Talking the word to yourself. Ephesians 5.18 Be not drunk with wine, 
wherein is excess. It said, but be filled with the Spirit. How? Speaking to yourselves. Speaking to yourselves. Speaking to yourselves. With what? Psalms. Spiritual songs. Melodies in your heart. So he's telling you, if you talk the word to yourself, a point will come, you will become like a drunk person by the anointing. Most of us don't know these things. We don't do them. Talk the word to yourself. When you are tired, play it to yourself. And then read it and talk it to yourself. And see the way the anointing on your life will go to work. Then you become a wonder to your world. When you stare, then the next thing is to engage. But engagement is for another day. And then while you are engaging, you must be conscious to preserve it. You preserve it through humility. You preserve it through purity of life. You preserve it through... I wrote four things. You preserve it through avoidance of covetousness. And you preserve it through peace with all men. So that you don't allow wickedness into your heart. There are four things that corrupt vessels faster than anything. Number one is sexual immorality. Number two is pride. Number three is covetousness. And number four is wickedness of the heart. Look at Satan. As anointed as he was, he coveted the throne of God. And because of pride, he wanted to be greater than all the angels. That was how he corrupted himself. The anointing may not be corrupt. But the vessel become corrupt. And when the vessel become corrupt, the anointing will no longer work. Then, most times, another spirit takes over them. And they think they are still prophesying. They have moved from prophecy to divination. <laughs> Stare the anointing. Engage the anointing. And preserve the anointing. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son Jesus Christ and that he died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. If you just said this prayers, congratulations, you are now a member of the family of God. Kindly send us an email, prayer at encounterjesusministriesinternational.org. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministriesinternational.org. God bless you.